for those that um, have been, um, we know of that have come down with the illness, the virus. And um, so we're just keeping a lot of people in prayer. And if you have any prayer requests at the end of our discipleship class, you can either type them in on our Facebook page, or if you want to join in our Zoom, you can certainly join in our Zoom broadcast and uh, put your prayer requests in. Okay, I'm gonna do just a little bit of housekeeping here. We're gonna share our Facebook live stream. So give me just a minute before we actually get started. Okay. I'm gonna do just a little bit of how to share on Facebook live stream. So and you're welcome to share the um this live stream also. Okay. Um we're gonna actually start off with prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us safely through another week. Lord, we just bless your holy and righteous name, and we just thank you for your goodness towards us, Lord God. We pray for all of those, Lord, who have been stricken with the COVID virus. We pray for healing for them. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones, Lord, to the COVID virus. We pray for comfort for them and closure for them. Lord. And Lord, as we open up this uh, lesson study today, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we ask that your spirit would lead and guide us into all truth. And that you would make your presence felt and make your presence known. And that these uh, things that we study, Lord, we will hide in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. And we invite in the presence specifically of your Holy Spirit with us today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. We are studying today from the book Testimonies for the Church. And we are studying from chapter 61. And this chapter is entitled Philosophy and Vain Deceit. And um, so we're going to jump right in and um, you can make your comments or you can, uh, if you're on our Facebook page, you can type in your comments. Okay. Um, in this chapter, uh, Ellen White is talking about the devices of Satan and she's talking about how Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light and he's deceiving thousands upon thousands of people. And it, she says the advantage he takes of the science of the human mind is tremendous. And here, serpent-like, he impercept imperceptibly creeps in to control the work, to corrupt, I'm sorry, the work of God. And then she talks about the miracles and the works of Christ. He wants to make appear as the result of human skill. Wait a minute, let me add some people into it. And um, he wants to make it appear as the result of human skill and power. And um, he wants to uh, make a bold attack upon Christianity. But I'm um, sorry, he doesn't want to make a bold attack upon Christianity because he knows that if he did that, then those Christians that are truly looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ would now run to the foot of the Savior. And so he does it imperceptibly and he does it with creeping compromise and he does it in a way that we don't feel distressed or we don't feel afraid or we don't feel fearful. Zoom. And so, hello, Lee. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so, um, so uh, she's talking about how, um, therefore, the, the enemy transforms himself into an angel of light to work upon our minds to allure us from the only safe and right path. And she talks about three different sciences that he uses, phrenology, psychology, and mesmerism. Uh -huh. And does anybody know what phrenology is? Used to be a study of the brain uh, that your brain does 
certain characteristics and they could tell stuff just by feeling on your head or something. <laughs> right, right. It was the shape and size of your your skull that it could, it could it could determine your intelligence and your mental abilities just based on the shape and size of your skull. And then I think we're all kind of familiar with psychology. So um, I think we don't really need to explain what psychology is. Basically, my father was a psychologist, as a matter of fact. Um, and it, that deals with the study of, of how the human mind works and that kind of thing. And then also mesmerism. Does anybody know what mesmerism is? Oh, hypnosis. Say hypnosis. Hypnosis. Right. Absolutely. Hypnosis. Uh, you know, there was a movie that came out a while ago, maybe, I don't know, two or three years ago now called um, Get Out. Mm-hmm. And that movie dealt with hypnotism. And I remember that um, a lot of people went to see that movie and I didn't know it dealt with hypnotism. And um when I figured out that it did deal with hypnotism, I remember uh, uh, something from Ellen White saying that we should not even be around that because even though we think we can handle it, that that is the enemy's way of encroaching into our minds. And so that was a movie that I haven't, that, that I wouldn't watch. Now, I know a lot of people did watch it, but just based upon her counsel, that was a movie that I didn't watch. Um, and so she says that those, these are the ways that Satan insinuates himself into our minds and works directly on this generation. And she said, those are, those are three things that we really need to be concerned about in the end time, which is our generation, uh, and, and the power that he has to work through these three, these three mediums. Um, And she said that Satan has come unperceived through these sciences and has poisoned the minds of thousands and led them to infidelity. And he is well pleased to have the knowledge of these sciences widespread. And so basically not only uh, is um, he looking to allure people, lure people in, but he he wants them to be known and he wants them to be, uh, uh, um, I guess, um, um, agreed to by people. As, as a means of, 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 of uh, I guess, knowing things and, and attain, obtaining knowledge. And um, it says, it is the plan which he himself has laid that he may gain access to minds and influence them as he pleases. Isn't that something? You know, a lot of times we as humans, we think that, you know, I got it going on. I know when I see Satan, I know when to run, I know uh, what I can handle, but really, Satan didn't lose any of his power when he was cast out of heaven. And he's got powers that we know not of. I'll just put it like that. And we think as finite human beings that we're a match and that we can determine those things that are for our good. But I am so glad that we have a heavenly father that has told us what things are for our good and anything else that doesn't, um, meet that standard that God has told us, then it must not be for our good. Um, it said, said the angel, mark its influence. The controversy between Christ and Satan is not yet ended. This entering in of Satan through the sciences is well devised by his satanic majesty. And in the minds of thousands will eventually destroy true faith in Christ being the Messiah, the son of God. Isn't that something? That, that really, Satan is really after Christ through these sciences. He's, just, he's really after Christ. I mean, of course, you know, he wants us to be lost. But what he's really after is Christ and destroying our faith in Christ. Um, I'm going down to uh, the third paragraph. I'm sorry, the fourth paragraph. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, uh, Chapter 61. Paragraph 291.1 um, it says Satan knew that when Christ should appear, mighty works and miracles will be wrought by him, that the world might know that the father had sent him. He trembled for his power. I mean, Satan, I guess, trembled for his power. He consulted with his angels how to accomplish a work which should answer a twofold purpose. Number one. He sought to destroy the influence of the work wrought by God through his servant Moses by working through his agents. 
and thus counterfeiting the true work of God. And number two, he sought to exert an influence by his work through the magicians, which would reach down through all ages and destroy in the minds of many true faith in the mighty miracles and works to be performed by Christ when he should come to this world. So she's really talking about when um, Satan went to the Pharaoh and asked for the deliverance of the children of Israel and how God allowed Moses to work certain miracles there. But then Satan then came in through the magicians and was able to work many of the same miracles. And so, but thereby hardening the Pharaoh's heart against the children of Israel and against the miracles that God had Moses to work. And so he had a twofold purpose to destroy those, that influence that Moses would have on the Pharaoh, but also to um, destroy the minds of many, many um, that, that down through the ages in God's mighty works. And so it says, Pharaoh, next, next paragraph, Pharaoh called for the magicians to work their enchantments. They also showed signs and wonders, for Satan came to their aid to work through them. Yet even here, the work of God was shown to be superior to the power of Satan. For the magicians could not perform all those miracles which God wrought through Moses. Only a few of them could they do. For instance, the magicians were able to make their their rods become, become ser serpents or snakes, but then God had Moses' rod. God had Moses' rod eat up the other snakes that the magicians had um, that the magicians had sought, had wrought. But then it says that then after that, Moses brought the lice, but Pharaoh's magicians could not uh, imitate that and could not produce lice. And it says that then they even had to, they were compelled to acknowledge that it was the finger of God that had brought the lice. And they said that to Pharaoh. Um, and it says that Satan was unwilling to have the people of Israel released from Egypt, Egyptian servitude, that they might serve God. The magicians failed to produce the miracle of the lice and could no more imitate Moses and Aaron. God would not suffer Satan to proceed further, and the magicians could not save themselves from the plagues. Isn't that something? That one, once God had enough, the magicians could not save themselves. They, they were subject to the plague. They were subject to the boils. They were subject to all those things that then came upon Egypt. And hey, they could not... Yes. You know, it was uh, this morning we talked in Sabbath school about how we have to trust the written word of God, his holy Bible. Uh -huh. And like you were just reading, the magicians can do so-called miracles also. And we're told that in the last days, Satan's still going to be working miracles so much that even the very elect could be fooled. So right. we have to realize that just because we see some uh, tricky looking stuff, that does not mean that that's God uh, speaking to us or through someone else. We have to really be careful. Uh, I kind of like watching the, these magicians that come on TV. They do some amazing things, but you got to know mm -hmm. only God can truly do miracles. Right. Satan's people are just doing tricks. Right, right. It's interesting because one time somebody sent me a YouTube video and the video, I'll just say it was pretty scary. It looked pretty real and it was pretty scary. And, you know, the, you know, spirit, the Bible says spirits of devils are going to come down working miracles. So it's not that they not that they just do tricks. They're going to work miracles. But you have to compare everything to the word of God to know whether it be from God or not, you know. And right. a lot of the things that like, you know, in a lot of horror movies, we see some crazy stuff. Well, you know, is that something that God would do, you know? And when you start seeing some crazy stuff in real life, because there's going to be crazy stuff that we're going to see. Um, would that be something that God would do? Would that be something that when you compare it to scripture, you know, because the Bible says by their fruits shall you know them. And when you compare it to scripture, is that something that God would do? And mm -hmm. scripture is always going to be our, our, our safeguard. Okay. Um, uh, down in paragraph 292.2, it says, 
God's controlling power here cut off the channel through which Satan worked and caused even those through whom Satan had wrought so wonderfully to feel his wrath, meaning that the, the magicians now um, were subject to the plagues. And it says, she says, sufficient evidence was given to Pharaoh to believe if he would. Moses wrought by the power of God. The magicians wrought not by their own science alone, but by the power of their God, the devil, who ingeniously carried out his deceptive work of counterfeiting the work of God. And we know, we know that, that there's nothing original about Satan. We know that he does a lot of counterfeiting because he really wanted to be God. And so all he can really do is counterfeit God. There's some things though that he just can't do and God just won't allow him to do. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. You know, one of the things that, that yeah. God doesn't allow him to do is to um, insinuate, is to force us to do anything through our minds. And that one, is something. On one part you had said about sufficient evidence given to Pharaoh to believe if he would. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important because sometime we'll read in the scriptures where it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean he literally stopped Pharaoh from believing. He want, okay. would have liked for him to believe, but Pharaoh okay. chose not to believe. He was influenced by Satan more than he allowed himself to be influenced by God. And God uh -huh. allowed him to go ahead right. and make that choice. Right, right. Um, Teresa, you have joined us, I see, but your microphone in your... Um, Video camera is off. If you intend that to be so, then that's fine. But if you want to join in, you'll need to go to the either the top or the bottom of your screen and unmute yourself. Uh, it went off. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it says, as we near the close of time, the human mind is more readily affected by Satan's devices. Why do you think that's so? Why do you think as we near the close of time, we're more susceptible to Satan's devices? Lack of study, no studying. Lack of study? Right. Lack of prayer, maybe? Yes. Lack of submission to the will of God, all those things, yes. maybe? Yes. Plus the devil's working harder because he knows he has a short time. Absolutely. He's working. You know, I used to be a Trekkie for those who used to, who know what I'm talking about. I used to be a Trekkie. And, you know, you have warp speed. And to me, Satan is working in warp speed. He's working in overdrive at this point um, to claim as many souls for his kingdom as he can. And so mm -hmm. he's basically and but but, you know, he know he knows what his end is going to be. But still, yet he wants to claim as many souls as he can in the meantime. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. Lee. He's working overtime or, or, or like he, he's working overtime. And it says. He leads deceived mortals to account for the works and miracles of Christ upon general principles. Satan has ever been ambitious to counterfeit the work of Christ and establish his own power and claims. So he wants us to believe that the miracles of Christ are attributable to human devices and human means, and that there is no divine, um, there's no divine power that has his hands on us or, you know, on the affairs of, uh, on human affairs and um it says he knows satan knows um he cannot do this openly and boldly so he's artful and knows that the most effective way for him to accomplish his work is to come to poor fallen man in the form of an angel of light hmm and uh i'm skipping down to paragraph 293.3 it says that and this was dealing with the um temptation of christ and how satan spread the whole world before christ in an attractive light and in it intimidated him that he need not endure so much suffering to obtain the kingdoms of the earth and he would yield all his claims if christ would worship him and it says Satan's dissatisfaction first commenced in heaven because he could not be first and highest in command, equal with God, exalted above Christ. He rebelled and lost his estate, and he and those who sympathized with him were turned out of heaven. In the wilderness, he hoped to gain advantage through the weak and suffering condition of Christ, 
and obtain from him that homage which he could not obtain in heaven. But Jesus, even in his faint and exhausted condition, yielded not to the temptation of Satan for a moment, but showed his superiority and exercised his authority by bidding Satan get thee hence. And so Satan was baffled. And he then studied how he could accomplish his purpose and receive the honor from the human race, which was refused him in heaven and by Jesus upon earth. So basically, after um, he could not tempt Christ to sin, Satan decided, you know what, I'm going to get the human, the human race to sin. And um, it's so funny. Uh, I was listening to a sermon today from Buddy Bird down at Oakwood. And uh, no, I'm sorry. Listening to um, Josiah. Christian Josiah today as he was preaching and he talked about, he said, there's a time to pray and a time to run. And sometimes we as Christians, we need to run. When we see certain mm -hmm. things happening or certain things coming towards us, we need to just run. Um, going down to the next uh, paragraph, paragraph two. Uh, before, you, before you go okay. there. Sure. I think that's a good point to remember because sometimes when we're tempted, we think to ourselves, oh, I'm a, I'm going to overcome temptation this time. Oh, I'm really, I'm ready now. I'm going to do it. I'm going to beat uh -huh. the devil at his own game when right. what we really need to do at that point is run. Right. You know, a lot of we times you still have the strength by ourselves. You're so right, Lee. And a lot of times we think, well, I think a lot of times we think we're a match for the enemy. We think, oh, mm. I know what he's up to and I can... I can dance with him a little bit, and, but not take it any further. And I think mm. that's the thinking of a lot of us. Or I know I, I can handle it. I know how much I can handle, you know, and we're no match for him. And we think that we are, but he didn't lose any power when he was cast out of heaven. Right. Like they say, don't dance with the devil. He always wants to lead. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, it says in paragraph 294.1, if Satan can so be fog and deceive the human mind as to lead mortals to think that there is an inherent power in themselves to accomplish great and good works, they cease to rely upon God to do for them that which they think there is power in themselves to do. They, they acknowledge not a superior power. They give not God the glory which he claims and which is due to his great and excellent majesty. Satan's object is thus accomplished and he exalts that fallen men presumptuously exalt themselves as he exalted himself in heaven and was thrust out. He knows that if man exalts himself, his ruin is just as certain as was his own. Those are some powerful words right there. You know, that if Satan can get us to depend on ourselves, then he knows he's 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 accomplished our ruin because our our walk as a Christian should be total reliance and dependence upon Christ. You know, the scripture that talks about the vine and how we must be uh, attached to the vine. That's mm -hmm. that's the way we'll make it to heaven and not a branch laying on the ground and saying, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it, <laughs> you know. We have to be connected to Christ in order to make it to heaven. Amen. Um, let's see, down in the next paragraph, 294.2 says, he, meaning Satan, leads fallen man through his all deceivableness of unrighteousness to believe that he can do very well without an atonement. Oh, that's a shuddering thought <laughs> we can do <laughs> without an atonement. And that he need not depend upon a crucified and risen savior that man's own merits will entitle him to God's favor. And then he destroys man's confidence in the Bible, well knowing that if he succeeds here and faith in the detector, which places a mark upon himself, is destroyed, he is safe. He fastens upon minds the delusion that there is no personal devil, and those who believe this make no effort to resist and war against that which they think does not exist. Thus, poor blind mortals finally adopt the maxim, whatever is right, they acknowledge no rule to measure their course. There was a lot said in that paragraph. And, you know, uh, what happens if our, if our confidence in the Bible is destroyed? 
We don't have any direction. There we don't have no any direction. direction. Go ahead. Um, there's no direction. And like she's saying, um, it's easy for us, uh, us to fall for Satan's tricks. And there's no, you know what? And there, there's really no standard of moral morality or ethical behavior and, and downright criminal behavior can prevail because there's no standards. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we were what born in. Sin and shaping in iniquity. Right. So our natural tendencies are already towards evil. And so if we don't have the Bible as a standard by which to say, okay, this is what we're trying to attain to, then every man is right in his own mind. Mm -hmm. You know, my mind is right about what's right. Your mind is right about what's right. You know, the next person's mind is right about what's right. And there's no, and you know, unless we have a heaven to take ourselves to or hell to keep ourselves from, then we're, we're, we're standing on sinking sand. But don't you think we are pretty much there right now, Karen? I mean, I think <laughs> we're looking at stuff and, you know, what we knew was sin, what I knew was sin 20 years ago is just being paraded around. And even, you know, um, some stuff, you know, um, the sinners are considered victims and victimized, et cetera, et cetera. So is, I think we just really are pretty much right there. Even in parenting, there's no... Um, no boundaries. There's, there's no real. Back in the day, an adult did A, B, and C, and the child did D, E, and F. You know, but now the children and the um, and the parents are doing, you know, pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right about that. Um, uh, another thing too was in this uh, couple paragraphs you just read. Satan wants us to not believe that he even exists. Right. Because if we don't know there's an enemy, then we don't spend time preparing against him or fighting against him. We just think, right. oh, I thought this up myself. So it must be right. And one mm -hmm. of the things that we have to remember, too, is that, uh, like you said, Satan never lost any of his power. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're made a little lower than the angels to begin with. Mm -hmm. So then and we're already made lower. Then we're affected by sin. And then throughout the ages, people have uh, just taken on less and less of an interest in education or, you know, strengthening the mind. So we're really not even anywhere close to a mental ability to handle what he, kind of tricks he's going to throw at us. And then, like Lakita's saying, when we stop believing in the scriptures, we're just, uh, I think Sister White writes it like, we're just infidels. We are lost on the sea crashing into the rocks of infidelity. Mm, mm, <laughs> wow. You know, I remember a conversation I had with my husband one day and he was telling me about, I think someone from his job and how the girl didn't believe in the devil. She, she, there's no such thing as a devil. And so he would point out to her some things that had happened in the news. He said, well, 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 what do you think that was about? Oh, that person just, you know, Basically, she attributed it, attributed bad acts to just that person, their upbringing mm -hmm. or their mental instability or, you know, they were just a bad person. And she just did not believe in the existence of the devil. But I and, think that there, go ahead. I think that there are people um, and, you know, you mentioned this, um, the science psychology, but there are some things up under the science of psychology theories or beliefs and there there is a belief that evil doesn't exist out mm -hmm. there you know it really is and but people believe in good but not evil it doesn't make sense <laughs> or they don't believe in it as a supernatural force you know they believe there are evil people but not that there is an override that there's a prince of this world i'll put it like that then there is also <laughs> the theory that Nothing is either right or wrong, but thinking makes it so. So if you don't think it's right, it ain't. And if you don't think it's wrong, then it isn't. Which basically, mm -hmm. again, goes back to uh, K Sarah Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Uh, you do you do your thing and I'll do mine and it doesn't really matter either way. That's the that theory. Sounds, that that's so funny because my husband watches Seinfeld a lot. And uh, there's an episode where 
I think somebody was telling some lies and, and, and one of the characters said, well, if you believe it, it's not a lie. That was Costanza. <laughs> <laughs> so you must be a hell person too. Then. <laughs> yeah. And also was- they have um, 50 shades of gray. That was a movie called 50 shades of gray. Uh-huh. And that there is just no absolute right or wrong. It's just, you know, whatever your opinion is, you know, more relativism. We even hear in the White House, alternative facts. There is, <laughs> <laughs> there is no alternative. Right. Fact. right is right and wrong is wrong. And so the devil tries to degrade the foundation of our morality. If you do away with the Holy Scripture as the foundation of morality, the Ten Commandments, then there is no absolute standard in this world. Have you, you want to live? I'm not going to judge you. You can't judge me, but there is an absolute standard and a judgment that we're going to have to face in the end. And Satan wants to diminish that. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, there's a scripture that talks about every man believing he's right in his own eyes, you know, and um, we have to be careful of that because it's easy to believe that, uh, you know, like if you're having an argument with someone, it's easy to believe that you're the one that's right and they're the one that's wrong. <laughs> now, sometimes that may actually be the case, but I remember somebody saying to me once, most things in this world are not a matter of right and wrong. They're a matter of opinion as far as between human beings and the arguments that we have, mm-hmm. you know? And so your opinion may be, you know, one thing, and my opinion may be something else. You know, your opinion may be, oh, that tasted really good. And my opinion may be, I didn't like the way that tasted, you know? <laughs> That's not to say <laughs> everything in this world is a matter of opinion. Because I think that you, you get on dangerous ground when you talk about the Bible being a matter of opinion. But some I think the, uh, the temptation saying that in the uh, Cloud Nine song, every man in his own mind is right. Oh, Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and it says down here in paragraph 294.2, he leads fallen man through all his deceivableness of unrighteousness to believe that he can do very well with, we talked about that without an atonement, um, uh, destroying man's confidence in the Bible, um, and faith in the detector, which places a mark upon him, self is destroyed and he is safe. He fastens upon minds. We talked about that, that there's no personal devil. And so they make no effort to resist him. Next paragraph, Satan leads many to believe that prayer to God is useless and but a formality. He well knows how needful are meditation and prayer to keep Christ's followers aroused to resist his cunning and deception. By his devices, he would divert the mind from these important exercises that the soul may not lean for help upon the mighty one and obtain strength from him to resist his attacks. So, you know, it's interesting because I always say that that the enemy doesn't care how you lo- how he gets you to be lost, just that you are lost. So he doesn't care that you're not out killing and robbing and stealing as long as he can keep you from spending that time with God and being strengthened by prayer and by study of God's word, then he knows he has you. What do you think about that? That's just the truth, that if we're not studying, I think Pastor Josiah um, reiterated this morning, which dog do you, which dog will win? And it's the mm-hmm. dog that you feed. So, right. you know, if you're feeding, if you're not feeding yourself the word of God, and if you're not Uh, remembering how God led you and meditating on his goodness to you and his word, then you're going to, you're just not going to have anything in the pot when it comes down to eating. It's just nothing there. So, and you're getting weaker and weaker, even though you don't realize it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like, um, it's not like the coronavirus. It just come up on you and bam, you sick and you know, you sick. It's more Mm kind of like, I would say cancer slowly, slowly growing, slowly growing. You're getting weaker and weaker and don't even realize you're getting weaker and weaker until you're at a place of no return. So that's what uh, it, it depends on. If you're not feeding yourself, you are going to be washed away. Hmm. One of the things that we had read about every trick that the devil tries to pull on us, every sin he gets us to commit, every 
evil thought or evil deed, it all leads back to his hatred of Christ. So from the very beginning, he's still mad about being kicked out of heaven, still mad that Christ is above him. So if he can get us to do anything, it all filters right back to his supreme hatred for Christ somehow. And I was watching this video with Michael Jordan, and he was saying uh, he played against Isaiah Thomas and the Detroit Pistons. And they asked him what he thought of him. And that was like in the 80s when they played. And Michael Jordan said he still can't stand him to this day. <laughs> so I was thinking about the devil. He still can't stand Jesus. Mm-hmm. All this time, he still hates him. And everything mm-hmm. he does is geared toward that hatred. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so funny. You ever hear about people having something against someone because something they did to them and the person's been dead and gone for 20 years mm-hmm. and they still hate that person, still hold something against that person. You know, I remember having a conversation with one of my family members and they were mad at somebody, a family member that had passed away. And I was like, you know what? You need to let that go because they're dead and gone now. You know, there's no point in holding on to that anymore. Um, let's go down to paragraph 296.1 says the prayer of faith is the great strength of the Christian and will assuredly prevail against Satan. How many of us think that we have a good prayer life? How many of us think that we should, uh, that we could have a better prayer life? I definitely could have better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so funny because sometimes I have every intention of praying throughout a day and then I'll get busy with something. And then I look back at the day and I haven't taken those steps to pray. I think about Daniel in the Bible and how he prayed three times a day, you know, just religiously, I'll put it like that, you know, consistently. And, um, and I think that, it, you know, we've always heard more prayer is more power. And we certainly need more power now in these in these times. And, you know, we're looking at the coronavirus and we're all, you know, just astonished at how quickly it came and how hor- how terrible it has been, you know, as far as the numbers that we're seeing. And but we know that this is only the beginning of sorrows. And so we have to have a firm grasp. We have to have a firm hold on the on the Lord in order to get through these times, especially if this is just the beginning of sorrows, you know? Amen. And um, in that same paragraph, it says, when he, the name of, wait a minute, I'm sorry. This is why he insinuates that we have no need of prayer because he knows that the prayer of faith is the great strength of the Christian and will help us prevail against him. The name of Jesus, our advocate, he detests. And when we earnestly come to him for help, Satan's host is alarmed. It serves his purpose well if we neglect the exercise of prayer, for then his lying wonders are more readily received. And then skipping down in that same paragraph, it says, Phrenology and mesmerism are very much exalted. They are good in their place, but they are seized upon by Satan as his most powerful agents to deceive and destroy souls. Art, his arts and devices are received as from heaven and faith in the detector, the Bible, is destroyed in the minds of thousands. That's interesting that she's calling the Bible the detector. Mm-hmm. What, 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 is, what does the Bible detect? Sin. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's that mirror that we, that we are to look into to determine if our face is dirty, right? And if we're just... Go ahead. I was going to say the Bible says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times through mesmerism, through the television, the Internet on our smartphones, it, it, it hypnotizes us into a point where we just are so entertained Mm. and and uh, Satan masterfully uses that to draw our minds away from the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really seek after spiritual things because our our spiritual uh, minds are so benumbed with the world that the spiritual things seem dull, but that's the life source of, of, of the human, of the human source. God says, I've come, I've come to give you life 
mm-hmm. and bring it more abundantly. And people are looking for all types of things to bring them some type of joy mm. and excitement in life. And it just leads to right. a dead end when it's the right. Bible that's the true source of life that gives you hope and faith into something more than what we see here in the, in the material. Right. You know, it's very interesting that um, right now during this quarantine time, people are protesting because they want to get back out there and enjoy the worldly things that they were enjoying before. Mm -hmm. And they want it so much so that I saw some signs that said, give me liberty or give me death. (laughs) You might get both. (laughs) Yeah, you'd be free from life. You'd be free from your life. <laughs> free to yeah. go out there and get the virus. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's crazy that, you know, we want something so much that's out there in the world that we're willing to risk our lives over it. You know? Well, I was, uh, I was noticing on some of the news reports that, you know, if you look at the pictures they show from Italy and from Spain and from France, there is nobody on those streets now. I mean, they're Mm -hmm. empty. But when you look at the pictures from America, you can hardly tell a difference. People out at the beach, people at the park, people Mm -hmm. still doing what they want to do. Because in America, we prize freedom over everything else, Mm -hmm. even to the even to the uh, extent of possible death. We'd rather Mm -hmm. just be free to choose death or, you know, whatever. I don't know that people are value liberty because they certainly will enslave anybody. No, they value their liberty. Right. Absolutely. Their liberty. I think they're just being self. I think to me, it's just, uh, and maybe it's the same thing. Maybe we're saying the same thing, but it's just self. I want this. It, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, they, they have pinpointed it on, on um, their liberty being able to free to walk around. But on the flip side of that, these, I don't really even think it's an argument about liberty. I think it's that, these are Republican people under a Democratic governor or something, and they're pushing back against that. That, you know, to me, liberty is the focus is really on liberty. It's not really about what I want to do. I need money. I need this. I need that. It's just, it, it's, it's more of a, in fact, it's a sacrifice. I think when you fight for liberty, you're actually willing to sacrifice something rather than to, because you're trying to gain money i want to gain the prestige i had i want to gain my position back that it's just selfishness that's what i'm looking at and rebelling against something uh an opposite view you know an opposite view but those people are gonna find out in two weeks or so they should have stayed home well you know what's interesting you said something there and uh it would be interesting if the people that are protesting to get back out once mm-hmm. they got out, the things that they wanted to do, those people stayed in. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because those people believe the medical professionals and they believe what the numbers and all of that, you know. So the things they wanted to get back out and do, they still couldn't do. That would be interesting. Mm. All your cameras off. I think they may may want it to be off. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Uh, it says down in the same paragraph, 296.1, the world which is supposed to be benefited so much by phrenology and animal magnetism, hypnotism, never was so corrupt. Satan uses these very things to destroy virtue and lay the foundation of spiritualism. And um, the next paragraph, I was directed to this scripture as especially applying to modern spiritualism, Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Thousands I was shown have been spoiled through the philosophy of phrenology and animal magnetism, which is hypnotism, and have been driven into infidelity. If the mind commences to run in this channel, it is almost sure to lose its balance and be controlled by a demon. Those are strong words. Mm. And so... It says, vain deceit fills the mind of poor mortals. They think there is such power in themselves to accomplish great works that they realize no necessity of a higher power. And that's interesting because by them, the very fact that they think there's no necessity of a higher power means that they're being controlled by the wrong higher power. Isn't that interesting? 
I don't think how people can think that we have so much power in ourselves to accomplish great works when everybody makes mistakes, everybody fails, nobody's perfect, and yet we still have this big idea of how great we are. Mm-hmm. We're not great. Only through Christ are we great. Mm-hmm. Right, absolutely. Uh, and it says in that same paragraph, Jesus has not taught them this philosophy. Nothing of the kind can be found in his teachings. He did not direct the minds of poor mortals to themselves or to a power which they possessed. He was ever directing their minds to God, the creator of the universe, as the source of their strength and wisdom. Special warning is given in verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So basically we're warned, the Bible's warning us, and she says a special warning that we not be led by these things that are leading people into spiritualism, that we not be drawn away by that. Next paragraph, she says, when once the fascinating influence of the arch deceiver overcomes you, you are poisoned and its deadly influence adulterates and destroys your faith in Christ being the son of God. And you cease to rely upon the merits of his blood. Those deceived by this philosophy are beguiled of their reward through the deceptions of Satan. They rely upon their own merits, exercise voluntary humility, are even willing to make sacrifices and debase themselves and yield their minds to the belief of supreme nonsense, receiving the most absurd ideas through those whom they believe to be their dead friends. You ever heard anybody saying they talked to somebody that was dead? Yeah. Or somebody that was dead talked to them? Yes. The same people they couldn't stand to get advice from when they were alive. (laughs) That's funny. That's funny. But I think usually when that happens, it's someone that they love. And that's why it's so believable to them. You know? And they, they, they believe that. I mean, I've had people in my family even talk about, oh, yeah, um, somebody came and appeared to them as a butterfly on their window. Really? And yeah, <laughs> you know, or, or, <laughs> or saying that um, somebody came and they would come sit on their bed and have conversations with them at night. You know? What was it that, you, that somebody you knew about, Lakita? Someone that I knew about, well, um, someone that I knew believed that their um, their dead sister was talking to them. Mm. Their dead sister. And this passed down to their child. And the child, you know, believed that she saw the dead auntie walking down the hallway. Mm. And, um, mm-hmm. Really kind of a tragic thing. Yeah, it can be scary for little kids. I recall uh, Elder Cleveland telling about how he he was at a in his bed sleep, and then looked up, and there was a looked like his grandma or whoever, somebody grandma, I think, at the foot of the bed. She was had been dead for a while, and he mm-hmm. knew it was the devil, and he just told him, "Get thee behind me, Satan," and mm-hmm. went on his business. But sometimes you'll see about people, and they're talking about. Yeah, grandma passed away and and I looked up and I saw a cloud and I knew that was grandma looking down on me. Mm-hmm. You know, people have some weird ideas. Some of it I think uh they're genuine. That's just the way they've been taught or what they believe. But it's all nonsense, you know. Yeah, and nonsense. that's where we go back to we have to keep the Bible as our root of all truth. Right. Right. And uh she goes on in the next paragraph to talk about how evil angels are the ones that assume the form of dead loved ones. Mm -hmm. And, and because they were around the people when they were alive, they can, they can talk about things that are related to those dead loved ones and stories Mm -hmm. and incidences connected with their lives and perform acts, which these people performed while they were living. And so they lead the dead relatives to believe that these deceased friends that that these de- that these deceased friends are now angels hovering about them and commuting with them. I remember listening to a story on one. It was on one of the news things. Like I don't know. I w- I don't want to call out any particular news show, but um, it was talking about this man and how and his family 
and how they were part of one particular faith. And then they went to a revival and they converted. And it may have even been to Adventism. And then the man said, and then one night he said, um, he heard the, the, I'm just going to say the Virgin Mary came to him and said, why did you leave me? Why did you leave me? I need you and your family to come back to me. And he said from that night on, he and his family went back to the old religion that they were a part of. Yeah. And said that this being was weeping and pleading with him to come back. And he he took his family back. And mm-hmm. so he 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 left the truth and went back to where he was before and took his mm-hmm. family with him. That's all part of the great deception uh, that Satan is going to really perpetrate at the end. And you could see it replete throughout um entertainment is all dealing with spiritualism and it goes back to the original lie that satan told eve that you shall not surely die so we have to have a firm understanding of the state of the dead you you know god says the living know that they shall die but the dead knoweth not anything right so you will not be deceived when people come to you in any in any form that you know is not of God. Mm-hmm. And that's Satan, Satan's right. tool to try to deceive people. But the world has, has accepted uh, uh, when a person's uh, dead, they can still come back. You always hear them saying, oh, they're in a better place. They're looking down. My mother was here and this, that, and the other. And so that they do not do not understand the scriptures. But Satan is going to... Uh, continue to use that more and more as we get to the end. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in the same paragraph, it says these evil angels who assume to be dead friends will either, they will adopt one of two positions. They'll either utterly reject God's word as idle tales, or if it suits their purposes best, they will select vital portions which testify of Christ and point out the way to heaven. And then they'll change it and say, well, this is what it really means. It doesn't mean that anymore. It means this. Mm-hmm. And that in that way, they will corrupt and ruin souls. But we know in the word of God declares in positive terms that the dead know not anything. And that's in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, which says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And so we know that that um, if though when those things really start happening on a on a on a large scale, and you know, we never know how Satan is laying the groundwork for that. You know, we're hearing about thousands upon thousands dying of COVID-19. Well, this is this thing came upon us so suddenly and so quickly. You know, people who are not prepared for it and they're certainly not prepared to let their loved ones go. And they're on top of that, they're not prepared to let their loved ones go without even being able to see them or have a funeral. And so you can imagine, you know, possibly the groundwork that Satan is laying to deceive people by these dead loved ones coming back to them. Um, that's hmm. something that that's certainly very possible. Um, down in the paragraph 299.1. She says, some I was shown gratify their curiosity and tamper with the devil. They have no real faith in spiritualism and would start back with horror at the idea of being mediums. Yet they venture and place themselves in a position where Satan can exercise his power upon them. Such do not mean to enter deep into this work, but they know not what they are doing. They are venturing on the devil's grounds and are tempting him to control them. This powerful destroyer considers them his lawful prey and exercises exercises his power upon them. And that is even against their will. When they wish to control themselves, they cannot. They yielded their minds to Satan and he will not release his claims, but holds them captive. No power can deliver the ensnared soul, but the power of God in answer to the earnest prayers of his faithful followers. Now, I remember hearing a story about some guys at Oakwood. They were students at Oakwood. And they didn't really believe in Ouija boards and all of that. 
So one night they just decided they were going to play around with it. And they said some things started happening in that room. It scared them to death. And I don't think they ever touched another Ouija board after that. That Ouija board is scary. I remember doing that growing up. And yeah, it's scary. I think it is evil angels dealing with that thing. Mm -hmm. I was looking at just the uh, uh, paragraph before what you read where it Mm -hmm. said, deceived mortals are worshiping evil angels, believing them to be spirits of their dead friends. And it Mm -hmm. reminded me, I was at the grocery store and I saw coming down the aisle, a guy that I thought had died. And I was like, this brother's supposed to be dead, ain't he? You know, and here he comes down the aisle. So I said, well, I ain't going to say nothing to him. And I went around the other aisle, you know, to avoid him because I'm like, I don't want to walk up on no evil angel. And then mm-hmm. I ended up coming, uh, going down a different aisle and ran right into him. Oh, and wow. So I started talking to him. I was like, okay, maybe I heard it was him, but it was somebody different. Mm. I hope it was, you know, but oh, wow. it ended up being that he hadn't died. It was some other person with the same name, similar name. Oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. But I wasn't taking no chances. Yeah, my mom okay. said, uh, she's going to go to her friend's, um, she's going to go to her friend's uh, church sure. because they were casting out demons. And she was like, oh, I just can't wait to get there. Keita, I can't wait to go and see them do that. I said, mm. you can really go go see them cast out some demons. She said, yeah. She said, they do it every week. And I'm getting ready to go. They were out of town. I said, mama, you better stay out of that church. She talking about why? I said, why do you think they can't, they um, they casting out demons every week? Because that demon is jumping out of one person and into the next person. Mm. I said, you go down there, they might jump out of them and into you and you come back here. Ain't nobody casting out demons in St. Louis. I said, See? you're going to be stuck. I said, <laughs> See? Yeah, you know, you, I do. I can't. When I feel the unholy the presence of unholy angels, you know, it's just time to pray. You just you right. can't allow them to be around you. One of them times to run. They only there to destroy you. That's what their goal is. Is not to uplift you. Right. Absolutely. Uh, we have about five more minutes left. Let's go down to paragraph three hundred one point two. It starts off saying, I was shown that Satan cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. Mm -hmm. Those who depart from the right are in serious danger now. They separate themselves from God and from the watch care of his angels. And Satan, ever upon the watch to destroy souls, begins to present to them his deceptions. And then um, if we go on down to paragraph 302.1, it says Satan is Christ's personal enemy. He is the originator and leader of every species of rebellion in heaven and on earth. His rage increases. And that's something you, uh, Lakita, you mentioned. Uh, we do not realize his power. If our eyes could be opened to, to discern the fallen angels at work with those who feel at ease and consider themselves safe, we would not feel so secure. Evil angels are upon our track every moment. We expect a readiness on the part of bad men to act as Satan suggests, but while our minds are unguarded against his invisible agents, they assume new ground and work marvels and miracles in our sight. Are we prepared to resist them by the word of God? Help us, Lord. Help us, right. Absolutely. And uh, in the very last uh, paragraph... uh, Uh, Before you go there, Karen, uh, you read that last sentence, but it's a second part to it. Are we prepared to resist them by the word of God? The only weapon we can use successfully. Mm -hmm. Right. And that goes back to how um, the Lord resisted Satan in the wilderness when he came Mm -hmm. to tempt him, you know, and not only do we have to know the word of God, but we know how to rightly divide the word of God. Because what's interesting about the temptation in the wilderness is that when he, when Satan first tempted Jesus, he said, you know, turn this, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus replied, it is written. And he quoted the word of God. So then the next thing Satan said, cast yourself down, you know, and, and his angels will bear thee up. Well, he said, cast yourself down. And then Satan quoted the word of God. It, it is written that he, his angels will bear thee up. And so Satan is a very cunning foe. And he saw where Jesus was going with it. And so he said, okay, He's going to quote the word of God. I'm going to quote the word of God. And Satan knows the word better than we do. 
Man. And so we still have to make sure that we are connected to the vine or to the branch so that even when we come upon situations that um, we're not familiar with and someone tells us, well, this is, this is what that means. We know because we've studied for ourselves to know what it means. So we One of the other be, things about, oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say that the Bible warns us saying that we need to be sober and vigilant, mm -hmm. sober in, in reading the Bible so that you can have a clear understanding and see Satan's deception under any disguise because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And right. we have to we have to guard the avenues of the mind right because satan is trying to infiltrate and the things that we watch the things that we do we can repel or attract demons into our own homes mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and this is a time if ever before we needed the lord we sure do need him now and we need to take this time to be drawing closer to him um and not closer to our worldly pursuits that we are now doing virtually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the very last sentence at the bottom of the last paragraph says, we must all now seek to arm ourselves for the contest in which we must soon engage. Faith in God's word, prayerfully studied and practically applied will be our shield from Satan's power and will bring us off conquerors through the blood of Christ. And so, um just gonna leave us with that that last thought we must arm ourselves and we must um take some time to study for ourselves and to rightly divide the word so that when we see things coming because we know that this COVID thing is just the beginning of sorrows and when we see things coming and things happening we will have a firm and sure foundation i want to thank all of you all for joining us today Paul, would you give us a word of prayer to close us out, please? Father God, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that you have preserved your word, Lord, that we can hide it in our hearts, that we may not sin against you. So, Lord, we're thankful for that opportunity, Lord. We pray that our faith will increase as we go through this life, Lord, that you said you would never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. Let us hold on to your precious promises that you have given us, that you're able to keep us from falling, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, for being a very present help in a time of trouble, Lord. Help us to not get ready, but be ready, Lord, when you come. Bless us to this end in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And for those who are members of TOP, remember our chat tomorrow at 3 p.m. You can, uh, you've been sent the link, and so you can jump on, and we can all chat together and have a good time. All right. Jo Karen, enjoy the rest of your on, Sabbath. Next week, okay. we're on Chapter 9, okay. Sunday Law. It's about the okay. Sunday Law. Okay, yes. Next, next week, Elder Lee Carroll will be teaching from Last Day Events, Chapter 9, about the Sunday Law. And a, remi a reminder also about the uh, quarantine revival that is going on nightly. Um, they're going to be going into week two. This is the end of week last night or week one going into week two. Um, you can check the time. It, I know it's seven, uh, 6 p.m. Central time. I think it's 7 p.m. Eastern time. And I guess if you're on the other coast, California coast, it's going to be 4 p.m. So um, we will, we broadcast it every night. So you can look at, look at it on our, any of our um, channels. And, and watch it. All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. All right, and hopefully all right. see you tomorrow on the chat. Bye now. See ya. Right. Were you saying something? <laughs>